Section 7 of Library of World's Best Mystery and Detective Stories, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roger Moline. Library of the World's Best Mystery and Detective Stories, Volume 4. By Julian Hawthorne, Editor. Section 7. Part One of The Horla, or Modern Ghosts, by Henri René Albert Guy de Maupassant. May 8th. What a lovely day! I have spent all the morning lying in the grass in front of my house, under the enormous plantain tree which covers it, and shades and shelters the whole of it. I like this part of the country, and I am fond of living here, because I am attached to it by deep roots profound and delicate roots which attach a man to the soil on which his ancestors were born and died, which attach him to what people think and what they eat, to the usages as well as to the food, local expressions, the peculiar language of the peasants, to the smell of the soil, of the villages, and of the atmosphere itself. I love my house in which I grew up. From my windows I can see the Seine, which flows by the side of my garden, on the other side of the road, almost through my grounds, the great and wide Seine, which goes to Rouen and Arve, and which is covered with boats passing to and fro. To the left, down yonder, lies Rouen, that large town with its blue roofs under its pointed Gothic towers. They are innumerable, delicate or broad dominated by the spire of the cathedral, and full of bells which sound through the blue air on fine mornings, sending their sweet and distant iron clang to me, their metallic sound which the breeze wafts in my direction, now stronger and now weaker, according as the wind is stronger or lighter. What a delicious morning it was! About eleven o'clock a long line of boats drawn by a steam-tug, as big as a fly, and which scarcely puffed while emitting its thick smoke, passed my gate. After two English schooners, whose red flag fluttered toward the sky, there came a magnificent Brazilian three-master. It was perfectly white and wonderfully clean and shining. I saluted it, I hardly know why, except that the sight of the vessel gave me great pleasure. May 12th. I have had a slight feverish attack for the last few days, and I feel ill, or rather I feel low-spirited. Whence do these mysterious influences come, which change our happiness into discouragement and our self-confidence into diffidence? One might almost say that the air, the invisible air, is full of unknown forces whose mysterious presence we have to endure. I wake up in the best spirits, with an inclination to sing in my throat. Why? I go down by the side of the water, and suddenly, after walking a short distance, I return home wretched, as if some misfortune were awaiting me there. Why? Is it a cold shiver which, passing over my skin, has upset my nerves and given me low spirits? Is it the form of the clouds? or the color of the sky, or the color of the surrounding objects which is so changeable, which have troubled my thoughts as they passed before my eyes? Who can tell? Everything that surrounds us, everything that we see without looking at it, everything that we touch without knowing it, everything that we handle without feeling it, all that we meet without clearly distinguishing it, has a rapid, surprising, and inexplicable effect upon us and upon our organs, and through them on our ideas and on our heart itself. How profound that mystery of the invisible is! We cannot fathom it with our miserable senses, with our eyes which are unable to perceive what is either too small or too great, too near to or too far from us. Neither the inhabitants of a star nor of a drop of water with our ears that deceive us, for they transmit to us the vibrations of the air in sonorous notes. They are fairies who work the miracle of changing that movement into noise, and by that metamorphosis give birth to music, 
which makes the mute agitation of nature musical, with our sense of smell, which is smaller than that of a dog, with our sense of taste, which can scarcely distinguish the age of a wine. Oh, if we only had other organs which would work other miracles in our favor, what a number of fresh things we might discover around us. May 16th. I am ill, decidedly. I was so well last month. I am feverish, horribly feverish, or rather I am in a state of feverish enervation, which makes my mind suffer as much as my body. I have without ceasing that horrible sensation of some danger threatening me, that apprehension of some coming misfortune or of approaching death, that presentiment which is, no doubt, an attack of some illness which is still unknown which germinates in the flesh and in the blood. May 18th. I have just come from consulting my medical man, for I could no longer get any sleep. He found that my pulse was high, my eyes dilated, my nerves highly strung, but no alarming symptoms. I must have a course of shower baths and of bromide of potassium. May 25th. No change. My state is really very peculiar. As the evening comes on, an incomprehensible feeling of disquietude seizes me, just as if night concealed some terrible menace toward me. I dine quickly and then try to read, but I do not understand the words, and can scarcely distinguish the letters. Then I walk up and down my drawing-room, oppressed by a feeling of confused and irresistible fear, the fear of sleep and fear of my bed. About ten o'clock I go up to my room. As soon as I have got in, I double lock and bolt it. I am frightened. Of what? Up till the present time I have been frightened of nothing. I open my cupboards and look under my bed. I listen. I listen. To what? How strange it is that a simple feeling of discomfort, impeded or heightened circulation, perhaps the irritation of a nervous thread, a slight congestion, a small disturbance in the imperfect and delicate functions of our living machinery, can turn the most light-hearted of men into a melancholy one and make a coward of the bravest. Then I go to bed and I wait for sleep as a man might wait for the executioner. I wait for its coming with dread, and my heart beats and my legs tremble, while my whole body shivers beneath the warmth of the bedclothes, until the moment when I suddenly fall asleep, as one would throw oneself into a pool of stagnant water in order to drown oneself. I do not feel coming over me as I used to do formerly, this perfidious sleep which is close to me and watching me, which is going to seize me by the head, to close my eyes and annihilate me. I sleep a long time, two or three hours perhaps, then a dream, no, a nightmare lays hold on me. I feel that I am in bed and asleep, I feel it and I know it, and I feel also that somebody is coming close to me, is looking at me, touching me, is getting on to my bed, is kneeling on my chest, is taking my neck between his hands and squeezing it, squeezing it with all his might in order to strangle me. I struggle, bound by that terrible powerlessness which paralyzes us in our dreams. I try to cry out, but I cannot. I want to move. I cannot. I try, with the most violent efforts and out of breath, to turn over and throw off this being which is crushing and suffocating me. I cannot. And then, suddenly, I wake up, shaken and bathed in perspiration. I light a candle and find that I am alone, and after that crisis, which occurs every night, I at length fall asleep and slumber tranquilly until morning. June 2nd. My state has grown worse. What is the matter with me? The bromide does me no good, 
and the shower baths have no effect whatever. Sometimes, in order to tire myself out, though I am fatigued enough already, I go for a walk in the forest of Rumer. I used to think at first that the fresh light and soft air, impregnated with the odor of herbs and leaves, would instill new blood into my veins and impart fresh energy to my heart. I turned into a broad ride in the wood, and then I turned toward La Bouille, through a narrow path, between two rows of exceedingly tall trees, which placed a thick, green, almost black roof between the sky and me. A sudden shiver ran through me, not a cold shiver, but a shiver of agony, and so I hastened my steps, uneasy at being alone in the wood, frightened stupidly and without reason at the profound solitude. Suddenly it seemed to me as if I were being followed, that somebody was walking at my heels. Close, quite close to me, near enough to touch me. I turned round suddenly, but I was alone. I saw nothing behind me except the straight, broad ride, empty and bordered by high trees, horribly empty. On the other side it also extended until it was lost in the distance, and looked just the same, terrible. I closed my eyes. Why? And then I began to turn round on one heel very quickly, just like a top. I nearly fell down, and opened my eyes. The trees were dancing round me, and the earth heaved. I was obliged to sit down. Then, ah, I no longer remembered how I had come. What a strange idea! What a strange, strange idea! I did not the least know. I started off to the right and got back into the avenue which had led me into the middle of the forest. June 3rd. I have had a terrible night. I shall go away for a few weeks, for no doubt a journey will set me up again. July 2nd. I have come back, quite cured, and have had a most delightful trip into the bargain. I have been to Mont Saint Michel, which I had not seen before. What a sight when one arrives as I did at Avranches toward the end of the day! The town stands on a hill, and I was taken into the public garden at the extremity of the town. I uttered a cry of astonishment. An extraordinarily large bay lay extended before me, as far as my eyes could reach between two hills which were lost to sight in the mist. And in the middle of this immense yellow bay, under a clear golden sky, a peculiar hill rose up, somber and pointed in the midst of the sand. The sun had just disappeared, and under the still flaming sky the outline of that fantastic rock stood out, which bears on its summit a fantastic monument. At daybreak I went to it. The tide was low, as it had been the night before, and I saw that wonderful abbey rise up before me as I approached it. After several hours' walking, I reached the enormous mass of rocks which supports the little town, dominated by the great church. Having climbed the steep and narrow street, I entered the most wonderful Gothic building that has ever been built to God on earth as large as a town, full of low rooms which seem buried beneath vaulted roofs and lofty galleries supported by delicate columns. I entered this gigantic granite jewel, which is as light as a bit of lace, covered with towers, with slender belfries to which spiral staircases ascend, and which raise their strange heads that bristle with chimeras, with devils, with fantastic animals, with monstrous flowers, and which are joined together by finely carved arches to the blue sky by day and to the black sky by night. When I had reached the summit, I said to the monk who accompanied me, "'Father, how happy you must be here!' And he replied, "'It is very windy, monsieur.' And so we began to talk while watching the rising tide, which ran over the sand and covered it with a steel kiosk. And then the monk told me stories, 
all the old stories belonging to the place, legends, nothing but legends. One of them struck me forcibly. The country people, those belonging to the Mornay, declare that at night one can hear talking going on in the sand, and then that one hears two goats bleat, one with a strong, the other with a weak voice. Incredulous people declare that it is nothing but the cry of the seabirds, which occasionally resembles bleatings and occasionally human lamentations. But belated fishermen swear that they have met an old shepherd, whose head, which is covered by his cloak, they can never see, wandering on the downs, between two tides, round the little town placed so far out of the world, and who is guiding and walking before them, a he-goat with a man's face, and a she-goat with a woman's face, and both of them with white hair, and talking incessantly, quarreling in a strange language, and then suddenly ceasing to talk in order to bleat with all their might. "'Do you believe it?' I asked the monk. "'I scarcely know,' he replied, and I continued, "'If there are other beings besides ourselves on this earth, how comes it that we have not known it for so long a time, or why have you not seen them? How is it that I have not seen them?' He replied, "'Do we see the hundred thousandth part of what exists? Look here, there is the wind.' which is the strongest force in nature, which knocks men down and blows down buildings, uproots trees, raises the sea into mountains of water, destroys cliffs and casts great ships onto the breakers. The wind which kills, which whistles, which sighs, which roars. Have you ever seen it? And can you see it? It exists for all that, however. I was silent before this simple reasoning. That man was a philosopher, or perhaps a fool. I could not say which exactly, so I held my tongue. What he had said had often been in my own thoughts. July 3rd I have slept badly. Certainly there is some feverish influence here, for my coachman is suffering in the same way as I am. When I went back home yesterday, I noticed his singular paleness, and I asked him, "'What is the matter with you, Jean?' "'The matter is that I never get any rest, and my nights devour my days. Since your departure, monsieur, there has been a spell over me. However, the other servants are all well, but I am very frightened of having another attack myself.' July 4th. I am decidedly taken again, for my old nightmares have returned. Last night I felt somebody leaning on me who was sucking my life from between my lips with his mouth. Yes, he was sucking it out of my neck, like a leech would have done. Then he got up, satiated, and I woke up, so beaten, crushed, and annihilated that I could not move. If this continues for a few days, I shall certainly go away again. July 5th. Have I lost my reason? What has happened? What I saw last night is so strange that my head wanders when I think of it. As I do now every evening, I had locked my door, and then, being thirsty, I drank half a glass of water and I accidentally noticed that the water bottle was full up to the cut-glass stopper. Then I went to bed and fell into one of my terrible sleeps, from which I was aroused in about two hours by a still more terrible shock. Picture to yourself a sleeping man who is being murdered, and who wakes up with a knife in his chest, and who is rattling in his throat, covered with blood, and who can no longer breathe, and is going to die and does not understand anything at all about it. There it is. Having recovered my senses, I was thirsty again, so I lit a candle and went to the table on which my water bottle was. I lifted it up and tilted it over my glass, but nothing came out. It was empty. 
It was completely empty. At first I could not understand it at all, and then suddenly I was seized by such a terrible feeling that I had to sit down, or rather I fell into a chair. Then I sprang up with a bound to look about me, and then I sat down again, overcome by astonishment and fear, in front of the transparent crystal bottle. I looked at it with fixed eyes, trying to conjecture, and my hands trembled. Somebody had drunk the water, but who? I? I, without any doubt. It could surely only be I. In that case I was a somnambulist. I lived, without knowing it, that double mysterious life which makes us doubt whether there are not two beings in us, or whether a strange, unknowable, and invisible being does not at such moments, when our soul is in a state of torpor, animate our captive body which obeys this other being as it does us ourselves and more than it does ourselves. Oh, who will understand my horrible agony? Who will understand the emotion of a man who is sound in mind, wide awake, full of sound sense, and who looks in horror at the remains of a little water that has disappeared while he was asleep, through the glass of a water bottle? And I remained there until it was daylight, without venturing to go to bed again. July 6th I am going mad. Again, all the contents of my water bottle have been drunk during the night, or rather I have drunk it. But is it I? Is it I? Who could it be? Who? Oh, God! Am I going mad? Who will save me? July 10th I have just been through some surprising ordeals. Decidedly, I am mad. And yet... On July 6th, before going to bed, I put some wine, milk, water, bread, and strawberries on my table. Somebody drank, I drank, all the water and a little of the milk. But neither the wine, bread, nor the strawberries were touched. On the 7th of July I renewed the same experiment, with the same results. And on July 8th, I left out the water and the milk, and nothing was touched. Lastly, on July 9th, I put only water and milk on my table, taking care to wrap up the bottles in white muslin and to tie down the stoppers. Then I rubbed my lips, my beard, and my hands with pencil lead and went to bed. Irresistible sleep seized me, which was soon followed by a terrible awakening. I had not moved, and my sheets were not marked. I rushed to the table. The muslin round the bottles remained intact. I undid the string, trembling with fear. All the water had been drunk, and so had the milk. Ah, great God! I must start for Paris immediately. July 12th. Paris. I must have lost my head during the last few days. I must be the plaything of my enervated imagination, unless I am really a somnambulist, or that I have been brought under the power of one of those influences which have been proved to exist, but which have hitherto been inexplicable, which are called suggestions. In any case, my mental state bordered on madness and twenty-four hours of Paris sufficed to restore me to my equilibrium. Yesterday, after doing some business and paying some visits which instilled fresh and invigorating mental air into me, I wound up my evening at the Théâtre Français. A play by Alexandre Dumas the Younger was being acted, and his active and powerful mind completed my cure. Certainly solitude is dangerous for active minds. We require men who can think and can talk around us. When we are alone for a long time, we people space with phantoms. I returned along the boulevards to my hotel in excellent spirits. 
amid the jostling of the crowd, I thought, not without irony, of my terrors and surmises of the previous week, because I believed, yes, I believed, that an invisible being lived beneath my roof. How weak our head is, and how quickly it is terrified and goes astray, as soon as we are struck by a small, incomprehensible fact. Instead of concluding with these simple words, I do not understand because the cause escapes me, we immediately imagine terrible mysteries and supernatural powers. July 14th Fete of the Republic I walked through the streets, and the crackers and flags amused me like a child. Still, it is very foolish to be merry on a fixed date, by a government decree. The populace is an imbecile flock of sheep, now steadily patient, and now in ferocious revolt. Say to it, Amuse yourself, and it amuses itself. Say to it, Go and fight with your neighbor, and it goes and fights. Say to it, Vote for the emperor, and it votes for the emperor. And then say to it, Vote for the republic, and it votes for the republic. Those who direct it are also stupid, but instead of obeying men, they obey principles, which can only be stupid, sterile, and false, for the very reason that they are principles, that is to say, ideas which are considered as certain and unchangeable in this world where one is certain of nothing, since light is an illusion and noise is an illusion. July 16th I saw some things yesterday that troubled me very much. I was dining at my cousin's, Madame Sablé, whose husband is colonel of the seventy-six chasseurs at Limoges. There were two young women there, one of whom had married a medical man, Dr. Parent, who devotes himself a great deal to nervous diseases and the extraordinary manifestations to which, at this moment, experiments in hypnotism and suggestion give rise. He related to us at some length the enormous results obtained by English scientists and the doctors of the medical school at Nancy, and the facts which he adduced appeared to me so strange that I declared that I was altogether incredulous. "'We are,' he declared, "'on the point of discovering one of the most important secrets of nature. I mean to say, one of its most important secrets on this earth.' for there are certainly some which are of a different kind of importance up in the stars, yonder. Ever since man has thought, since he has been able to express and write down his thoughts, he has felt himself close to a mystery which is impenetrable in his coarse and imperfect senses, and he endeavors to supplement the want of power of his organs by the efforts of his intellect. As long as that intellect still remained in its elementary stage, this intercourse with invisible spirits assumed forms which were commonplace, though terrifying. Thence sprang the popular belief in the supernatural, the legends of wandering spirits, of fairies, of gnomes, ghosts. I might even say the legend of God, for our conceptions of the workman creator, from whatever religion they may have come down to us, are certainly the most mediocre the stupidest and the most unacceptable inventions that ever sprang from the frightened brain of any human creatures. Nothing is truer than what Voltaire says, God made man in his own image, but man has certainly paid him back again. But for rather more than a century, men seem to have had a presentiment of something new. Mesmer and some others have put us on an unexpected track, and especially within the last two or three years we have arrived at really surprising results. My cousin, who is also very incredulous, smiled, and Dr. Parron said to her, "'Would you like me to try and send you to sleep, madame?' "'Yes, certainly.' She sat down in an easy chair, and he began to look at her fixedly, so as to fascinate her. I suddenly felt myself somewhat uncomfortable, with a beating heart and a choking feeling in my throat. 
I saw that Madame Sablé's eyes were growing heavy, her mouth twitched and her bosom heaved, and at the end of ten minutes she was asleep. "'Stand behind her,' the doctor said to me, and so I took a seat behind her. He put a visiting card into her hands and said to her, "'This is a looking-glass. What do you see in it?' And she replied, "'I see my cousin.' "'What is he doing?' "'He is twisting his mustache. "'And now?' "'He is taking a photograph out of his pocket.' "'Whose photograph is it?' "'His own.' "'That was true, and that photograph had been given me that same evening at the hotel. "'What is his attitude in this portrait?' "'He is standing up with his hat in his hand.' So she saw on that card, on that piece of white pasteboard, as if she had seen it in a looking-glass. The young women were frightened and exclaimed, "'That is quite enough! Quite, quite enough!' But the doctor said to her authoritatively, "'You will get up at eight o'clock tomorrow morning. Then you will go and call on your cousin at his hotel and ask him to lend you five thousand francs, which your husband demands of you, and which he will ask for when he sets out on his coming journey. Then he woke her up. On returning to my hotel, I thought over this curious seance, and I was assailed by doubts, not as to my cousin's absolute and undoubted good faith, for I had known her as well as if she had been my own sister ever since she was a child, but as to a possible trick on the doctor's part. Had not he, perhaps, kept a glass hidden in his hand, which he showed to the young woman in her sleep, at the same time as he did the card? Professional conjurers do things which are just as singular. So I went home and to bed, and this morning, at about half-past eight, I was awakened by my footman, who said to me, "'Madame Sablé has asked to see you immediately, monsieur.' So I dressed hastily and went to her. She sat down in some agitation, with her eyes on the floor, and without raising her veil she said to me, "'My dear cousin, I am going to ask a great favor of you.' "'What is it, cousin?' I do not like to tell you, and yet I must. I am in absolute want of five thousand francs. What? You? Yes, I, or rather my husband, who has asked me to procure them for him. I was so stupefied that I stammered out my answers. I asked myself whether she had not really been making fun of me with Dr. Parent if it were not merely a very well-acted farce which had been got up beforehand. On looking at her attentively, however, my doubts disappeared. She was trembling with grief, so painful was this step to her, and I was sure that her throat was full of sobs. I knew that she was very rich, and so I continued, "'What? Has not your husband five thousand francs at his disposal?' Come, think. Are you sure that he commissioned you to ask me for them? She hesitated for a few seconds, as if she were making a great effort to search her memory, and then she replied, Yes, yes, I am quite sure of it. Has he written to you? She hesitated again and reflected, and I guessed the torture of her thoughts. She did not know. She only knew that she was to borrow five thousand francs of me for her husband. So she told a lie. Yes, he has written to me. When, pray? You did not mention it to me yesterday. I received his letter this morning. Can you show it to me? No, 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 it contained private matters things too personal to ourselves. I burnt it. So your husband runs into debt? 
She hesitated again, and then murmured, "'I do not know.' Thereupon I said bluntly, "'I have not five thousand francs at my disposal at this moment, my dear cousin.' She uttered a kind of cry as if she were in pain, and said, "'Oh, oh, I beseech you, I beseech you to get them for me.' She got excited, and clasped her hands as if she were praying to me. I heard her voice change its tone. She wept and stammered, harassed and dominated by the irresistible order that she had received. "'Oh, oh, I beg you to—' If you know what I am suffering, I want them today. I had pity on her. You shall have them by and by, I swear to you. Oh, thank you, thank you, how kind you are. I continued, Do you remember what took place at your house last night? Yes. Do you remember that Dr. Perron sent you to sleep? Yes. Oh, very well, then. He ordered you to come to me this morning to borrow five thousand francs, and at this moment you are obeying that suggestion. She considered for a few moments, and then replied, But as it is my husband who wants them... For a whole hour I tried to convince her, but could not succeed, and when she had gone I went to the doctor. He was just going out, and he listened to me with a smile, and said, "'Do you believe now?' "'Yes, I cannot help it.' "'Let us go to your cousin's.' She was already dozing on a couch, overcome with fatigue. The doctor felt her pulse, looked at her for some time with one hand raised toward her eyes, which she closed by degrees under the irresistible power of this magnetic influence, and when she was asleep he said, "'Your husband does not require the five thousand francs any longer. You must therefore forget that you asked your cousin to lend them to you, and if he speaks to you about it you will not understand him.' Then he woke her up, and I took out a pocket-book and said, here is what you asked me for this morning, my dear cousin. But she was so surprised that I did not venture to persist. Nevertheless, I tried to recall the circumstance to her, but she denied it vigorously, thought that I was making fun of her, and in the end very nearly lost her temper. End of Section 7 Part 1 of The Horla, or Modern Ghosts Recording by Roger Moline